and welcome back to Bites of History with Irene Walton. I'm, of course, your host, Irene Walton. And if you are noticing a bit of a different background or hearing maybe a little bit of an echoier sound today, it is because this is our first podcast recording in my new apartment. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see that not everything is set up, not everything is ready, but that is okay because we're trying our best. And if it's a little echoey, it's because I don't have a couch or a chair or a rug (laughs) and it's just the bed. So my apologies for any technical difficulties, but I'm so happy to have you here. I'm so happy to be talking about this week's topic, which is the history of trick-or-treating. Have you ever wondered how it made it to your table? Have you ever wondered how it made it to your shelf? If you love food, then this is the show for you. Bites of History with Irene. I want to start by thanking all of my patrons. I'm so, so grateful for Patreon. They actually just had a big, huge update. So now there's like a new community page. It's so fun where I get to talk to everybody and we're all kind of in like this big giant group chat, which is super fun. And if you want to join my Patreon, you can join for join for as little as $2 a month. That is the little producer tier. We talk about the podcast. You guys give me ideas. I ask for ideas and you just really help support me and this show so that I can keep doing this. And I really, really appreciate all of the tiers in there. We have so much fun. There's four different tiers at four different price points. Please go check it out. You can check it out in the description down below. You can go to patreon.com slash Irene Walton, whatever your vibe is, however you get there, I'm here for it. So thank you for checking it out. And thank you to all my patrons. And I also want to thank all the sources for this episode. There were quite a few, quite a few cool ones too, actually. So thank you to history.com, nationalgeographic.com. Those are some go-tos in the book. Trick or Treat, A History of Halloween by Lisa Morton. I did not have the actual book. It was on like the Google Scholar page or whatever. So I got to see kind of like some excerpts from it, which were which were really, really cool and really helpful. And oh my God, hilariously, as I like sat down or as I got all my stuff together to record this today, I went on my podcast thing on my phone and saw that Stuff You Should Know, a podcast that I love very much, actually also has a history of trick or treat, trick or treating. So I think if you guys are loving this episode so much, go listen to theirs too, because I got a little bit of the information from there, but a little bit of the information is shared as well, because it's just the history of trick or treating. So there might be some overlap, but I think we both have fun and interesting things to bring to the table. Thank you. Like with every history that we do of anything, we're going to start at the beginning and end at the end. So to start everything out, I was just curious how kids running around the suburbs and begging for candy became such an okay thing to do, such a celebrated thing to do on this one very special day of the year when 364 of the other days of the year, it is pretty frowned upon to accept candy from strangers. Our understanding of where Halloween begins starts about 2,000 years ago in Ireland and Scotland with the holiday celebration of... It's it's spelled Samhain, but it's pronounced Samhain, so I always want to say Samhain. With the New Year's Celtic New Year's tradition of Samhain. Now, This day was on November 1st. However, the night before, October 31st, was considered to be where the veil between the living and the dead was thinnest. So these creatures from this kind of other deathly dimension, spiritual dimension, were able to cross over much easier on this night, October 31st, before the new year, November 1st. It was thought this because this is where our year really starts to turn into these darker days and kind of the darker part of the year days are shorter. It's colder. And it was just kind of understood and thought that this, this veil between the living and the dead was so thin, these demons and fairies and spirits would kind of cross over and to gain a little bit of favor with them and maybe protect themselves as well. People would dress up like demons and fairies and spirits so that they would kind of be confused. They wouldn't get hurt. They wouldn't be targeted. So that's where we kind of get this dressing up tradition. They would also have bonfires and leave out food for the spirits and the demons and the fairies to, again, gain favoritism. And we see these traditions kind of continuing at this same time of year, October 31st, November 1st. 
dressing up, special foods. This continues throughout Ireland's and Scotland's history and permeates the areas around it as well. As Christians slowly started to take over pagan holidays in the year about 600-ish, the Samhain, or Samhain, it's again spelled Samhain, pronounced Samhain, Samhain gets taken over and the tradition turning to English, like the Christians taking over this uh, holiday and translating it into English, slowly turns into All Hallows Eve. But they still keep up with the tradition of dressing up and having specialty foods, doing bonfires, special like traditions and, and things that they would do around this time of year. And around the first millennium, 1000 AD, we see this tradition spilling over into England and they start to call it All Souls Day. And this happens on November 2nd. Now, this new English holiday, All Souls Day, is kind of taking some of the traditions of Samhain. And there's dressing up and there's bonfires. But this day is more so a day to honor the dead and to appreciate them and to think about them. So it's not so much being afraid that they're crossing over so much as reminiscing on those, like the loved ones that people have lost. So with this, on this day, All Souls Day, on November 2nd, less fortunate families would go around to you know, wealthier families, more uh, affluent families, neighborhoods and homes knock on their doors and offer prayers for those that have passed in that home. So these less fortunate families were going into more affluent neighborhoods, knocking on doors, offering prayers, and in return would receive a soul cake. Now these soul cakes did look pretty good. They were, they just seemed to be like little pastries, little, little breads with maybe some icing or something on them, oftentimes having a cross on them to signify a prayer has been said. And that would sort of be like the treat. Somebody comes, offers you something. Again, some of these people were dressed up in tradition of All Souls Day, Samhain, All Hallows Eve. And the act of this was actually called souling. So these families would go souling in more affluent neighborhoods, offering prayers and getting little cakes, soul cakes in return. Eventually, it turned kind of more to a kid's tradition and the kids would be the one offering the prayers and the soul cakes would sort of become money or other little pastries, little treats. And even in some cases, ale. I know it was like not, it's not a thing to offer kids alcohol anymore, which I'm glad it is not but it was definitely a thing back then. Actually, that we should do an episode on how beer became so popular because a lot of times the water was so unsafe to drink in a lot of these places way back when uh, that beer, since it's like a fermented beverage, was a lot safer. So a lot of that's why kids were more likely to drink back then. It didn't seem like some big crazy thing because the water, we can do that in another episode. Sorry, I got excited. Now back in Scotland, like we were talking about earlier, some of these kids who were dressing up for Samhain or All Hallows Eve, whichever they were calling it, um, were running around, knocking on doors, singing little songs, doing little dances, and sometimes getting treats in return as well. Again, a very childlike tradition. When the Irish potato famine happened, which I do think we should do another episode on because fascinating. I also just saw a really cool thing about, we'll do it. We'll do, that'll be our next episode. When the Irish potato famine happened, a lot of them moved over to America to have a better life, to have more food available. And of course, like any immigrants, they bring their traditions with them. Thank God for that. We wouldn't have a culture without that. So Ireland brought their tradition of Samhain. With more and more immigration of Ireland, Scotland, and England to the United States, everyone was bringing their traditions, as well as seeing the traditions that America had already established and already had around this time of year. One of these was called bell snicking. Now, this was a terrifying, I'm going to put a picture up. It was a terrifying tradition where people around Christmas time on Christmas would dress up in these insane outfits and costumes. And they would go around to their neighbor's houses and like perform a little dance, perform a little song. And if the person whose house it was that the bell snicking people were going to couldn't guess who the bell snickerers were, then the bell snickerers like won a prize or won a treat or won something from that house. It was like a silly, goofy, weird little tradition. And it was very weird and scary. 
I'm very happy it doesn't happen anymore. Now, this was happening around the 1920s in the like northeast part of America mostly. Some uh, a lot of the traditions we see of bell snickling was also coming from Canada, but there was some in America in the 20s, and it would also be a thing that these like scary dressed up people coming to the house would like ask the kids if they had been good or bad. And if the kids had been good and everybody agreed, the bell snicklers would give the kids a treat. So there were a lot of like spooky, weird little traditions with costumes and treats already happening in the 1920s. Now with this, however, it led to a major rise in like actual pranking around this time of year in the like the darker season of the year, starting around October October 31st. This pranking was a lot of innocent, relatively silly, like tomfoolery. It wasn't super intense. There, there are a few customs and a few like crazy things. I think it's called the, um, like destroy day or like mischief day in a couple of areas, like in Jersey, I think they have a mischief day where it's just pranking. It's like, I think on the day before Halloween, this happens. And Part of the idea of where trick-or-treating might have come from is that these families in these houses are kind of waiting around knowing that this pranking is going to happen. So they're like, if I give you a little treat, will you please not do that? And then most of the kids were like, yeah, sounds pretty solid. I'll take your little piece of candy and not teepee your house or whatever it was. So that's kind of where trick-or-treating That's where the idea comes from, at least. But we don't see it written in any newspapers or anything until about 1927. And this was actually in a newspaper coming out of Alberta, Canada, where it was being written about because teenagers were going outside of people's houses and saying, trick or treat, and like kind of like taunting them, like, you better give me something or else I'm going to trick, I'm going to play a little prank on your house. So that's our first written notice of trick-or-treating, which I just think is so cool. I actually have a very cool little quote here from one of these old, you know, North American newspapers in from the 1930s. Young goblins and ghosts employing modern shakedown methods successfully worked the trick-or-treat system. This came from an Oregon newspaper. So people were dressing up already and waiting and expecting candy, but there was definitely more of a pranking element involved. As we always come back to, World War II had a major impact on trick-or-treating. Before the war happened, we were obviously in the Great Depression where things were really tricky, (laughs) for lack of a better word for this episode. People weren't really getting a lot of fun sweets and treats just throughout the year. And, you know, when poverty is striking your whole family and everybody you know, you're going to be a little more on edge. So the pranks were definitely a little bit more intense and they were causing more damage because people had way less. So when World War II happened and the sugar rationing occurred, trick-or-treating basically almost like went to the birds. It Because So many of these kids who were kind of running around and pranking some more intense pranks than others, not pranks, like physical assaults. Um, (laughs) While some of those kids went off to the war, the kids who were younger didn't have any treats that they could collect. So trick-or-treating almost completely died out in the 1940s. However, there was a massive boom after the war was over. And people started coming back home and moving out to the suburbs. Now, you have to remember, the suburbs are this insulary place that is safe. And it's families that you know, and it's people in your same age range with kids that are in your, you know, uh, with their kids or in your kid's class. And you know the family and you see them all the time. So you're not really worried about letting them go around and collect this candy that is now in a great abundance because people are making more money. The war was huge for the economy here. And it really comes back with a boom with so many people moving to the suburbs. In the 1940s is when we really see the pranking kind of take a pretty intense dip. It's not so much like these, what at some points were really intense scary pranks for some people and involved awful things and not nice things. It's pretty much just candy collection post-World War II. And we still see it a little bit today in some areas. There are little pranks here and there. Most of them are relatively harmless. You know, 
TPing a tree or, oh, which actually I always heard of it as TPing, like toilet papering a tree. And obviously that's wasteful, but I'm just saying it's better than like a physical assault. Um, <laughs> but I've heard it called in, in the stuff you should know episode, I heard it called rolling, which I'd never heard. Like you roll a house or you roll a tree in Britain. The pranking did stick around a little bit more after World War II and is like a bit does have a increased occurrence now more than it does here in North America. But there, the candy collection is still the main part of Halloween for most kids. And you may have heard some really scary stuff about that. You may have heard some really sad stories about kids getting like a razor blade in some of their candy or a hypodermic needle or poison being in the candy. Now, most of this is not true at all. There have been a couple instances, like in 1964, a woman in upstate New York was getting really tired of seeing teenagers come around and having to give them candy. And she was upset about that. So she gave them like dog biscuits and ant poison little pellets. That was not cool. Oh, and Brillo pads. That was not cool. However, in 1974, Timothy Mark O'Brien did not have as good of a result. Um, he actually ended up eating a cyanide laced pixie stick. What we end up finding out and what the police find out is that he did not get this in his own Halloween candy. Nobody gave this to him. It was given to him by his father so that he could then collect the life insurance, life insurance policy on his young son. This is back in 1974. I don't know if I mentioned that. Um, and he hid it in the son's Halloween candy to make it look like it had been given to him by somebody that was not his dad. Unfortunately, that story spread and people started really freaking out, understandably so. Um, there's also another really, really sad story about um, a couple of kids overdosing from some heroin that they had gotten from, I believe, their uncle. This one I heard on the podcast, so I'm not totally, I can't remember the facts exactly, but this was in the 80s, I believe. And so the uncle then kind of like scattered some of the went on the Halloween candy to make it look like it wasn't like his stash that they'd gotten it from. But again, that's a very isolated incident that didn't involve somebody giving poisoned Halloween candy to somebody. But those stories spread like wildfire. And understandably, parents started to freak out and it became a very scary thing, especially I don't know if you guys know about the Tylenol. Murders. If you don't. Very long story short, there was um, some really horrible things. A really, really despicable, disgusting person uh, laced a lot of Tylenol bottles in a specific area in, I believe, Chicago and ended up killing a few people. So all of these like very scary, I think also in the 80s, a lot of these very scary things were happening to items that can be ingested that are given to you from somebody else or purchased from a store. And so really, really, really checking people's or checking their kids. Halloween candy became super important and super popular. Hospitals also offered like to use their x-ray machines to check if there's razors or needles or anything in the candies. And a lot of parents won't let their kids eat any of the candy unless it's been home and inspected and gone through. If there's any open wrappers, you don't eat that. If there's any like pin pricks and stuff, you don't eat that. And, you know, I, I am somebody who tends, tends to my aggressive OCD. I am somebody who always is on the like better be better to be safe than sorry. With all that being said, trick or treating is still wildly popular. Obviously with COVID there is quite the dip, but people will always find ways to make it accessible. And I think that's really beautiful in apartment buildings. So many people decorate their doors and are so ready for kids to knock on it and hand candy out in areas that might not have too many houses or too many apartment buildings. People can do, um, a lot of like parking lots, like church parking lots, synagogue parking lots will do trunk or treats, which is really cool. So like people will open their car trunks and decorate those and hand candy out. A lot of malls do it for safety reasons. And I just think it's really beautiful that like trick or treating has become this thing that kind of just like can bring a lot of kids together and bring a lot of families together. And just people in general. I think it's very sweet. So that is the history of trick-or-treating. And with whatever you end up doing this holiday, Halloween-y season, please be careful. Check your candy. 
always look both ways when crossing streets. And I hope you and your family and your kids, or if you're going trick-or-treating, I hope you guys have a great and safe and wonderful time. And I just hope you have the best Halloween ever. Okay, love you. Bye. Thank you for listening. Bye.